everyone. I'm Steve Main, uh, back here with our weekly interview with Dr. Nario of Biointegrative Health Center. Um, as some, as you, uh, some of you may know, I'm in the health club business, and I've been in the health club business all my life, owning uh, multiple health clubs. And so we're going to talk about protein today. And uh, I come from more of a fitness type background. Um, and so uh, this is going to be one of my favorite topics. It's on protein. So uh, Dr. Nario, Biointegrative Health Center, Reno, Nevada. You can check them out online. Welcome, doctor. Hi, Steve. Thank you for the invite again. Okay. So we're going to talk about protein today. And, you know, um, off camera, we started talking about it a little bit. and. Uh, all the different types of protein and how is, is it absorbable and all that stuff. So give us your first thoughts on protein. I know you and I talk about many different diets from keto to uh, paleo to the Mediterranean diet, which is all fun stuff for me. But protein, what are your initial thoughts that you would just tell us about protein? Well, Steve, I know this is something that is very close to your heart. That's why we, we definitely want to address so many things for the audience about this. And uh, of course, we, we all like protein to build muscle, especially when you're an athlete, you're so consumed by protein. And it's all about the macros, as they, they call it. I hear this from the people who I go to the gym with. And we like our chicken, um, the breast, uh, thigh, steaks as uh, sources. But to be more specific about protein, protein is actually a macronutrient. And essential functions of protein is not only focusing on the muscle, there's more, uh, more to it than just muscle building. And this is also related to tissue repair, hormone regulation, facilitation of uh, enzymes and processes in our bodies, and even transportation of uh, molecules such as oxygen. And there are two sources that, in general, that we can consider where protein is coming from. One is plant and one is animal. And these, are, uh, these proteins are consisting of amino acids, which are what we call the building blocks. And protein sources vary in amounts of amino acids that they contain. And uh, that's why there's another classification that you can uh, think about um, such as protein can also be uh, classified as complete and incomplete. So complete protein contains all the nine essential amino acids that the body cannot create. And incomplete protein lacks the nine uh, essential amino acids. So don't need to memorize this, what I'm going to tell you. And this is kind of a tongue twister. And I'm sure, Steve, you know this, the isoleucine, histidine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and even valine are out of breath. But those are the nine um, amino acids that we consider essential. To make it simple, animal source, usually they are the ones that are considered complete protein. And plant-based proteins are the incomplete proteins, with the exception of soy, such as uh, in edamame, tempeh, or tofu. And some examples, common examples of complete proteins, that we all know this, beef, chicken, dairy, fish. And examples of inc incomplete proteins include beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, and peas. High, highest protein foods are usually considered to be in the animal-based uh, classification because they all have the essential amino acids. However, plant-based foods are not nutritionally inferior, uh, though they have lower uh, protein, but they are richer in uh, the other health-promoting dietary components, such as fiber, antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals versus animal-based um, sources. Yeah, it's just a fascinating topic, and uh, we can get into more about, I'm a big fan of the um, animal-based uh, protein, I mean, I mean uh, the, the vegan protein, like pea protein, I, I use it, um, and I, I train hard, but I spike it with leucine, which makes it more absorbable. Um, leucine is one of the branch chain aminos you mentioned right off the bat. Leucine, isoleucine, and valine, but leucine is two to one over the other two, 
don't want to get you confused here. Not you, Doc, our listeners. <laughs> no. um, if you spike it, whatever type of protein you're taking, it's going to be more absorbable. So you can get the benefit of what you just mentioned as far as all the different other nutrients in a plant-based protein and get it to be more absorbable because um, it's not as absorbable because of the amino acid profile. But anyway, um, so tell us a little bit about the significance or the good, the bad, the ugly of eating animal-based and animal-based type protein. Right. Well, Steve, that was an awesome hack that you just mentioned. Um, yeah, I hope the viewers who are very um, uh, in tuned with protein applies that. Well, going back to your question. Uh, animal protein, well, research actually has demonstrated that consumption of red meat, particularly processed, all right, I want you to underline the word processed meat, is associated with increased risk of total and all risk, uh, all cause risk of illness. And this is important to highlight for the reason that processed meat is the most prominent one uh, in, in the commercial market. We're talking about fast food, easy, easy food for access. So this is different when I talk about um, farm-raised um, game meat. And it's more important to highlight that consumers don't consider quality or livestock, uh, livestock management practices of the, the meat that they consume. So due to modern agricultural practices and high demand of animal protein, such as livestock raised in North America, where we are, and is uh, fed in grain rations and raised in industrial feedlots instead of uh, on nutrient-rich pastures plays a big factor in the quality of meat that we get. As a result, feedlot meat is often nutritionally inferior to grass-fed, uh, organically raised meat. And meat from grass-fed beef, which is organically raised, contains greater amounts of hard, healthy omega-3 fatty acids and a lower ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid than feedlot meat. So, a high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid, which is common in diets rich in processed food, uh, leads to actually a low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, impaired functioning of the lining of our blood vessels, and hardening of the arteries. Most common issue here is it's way more expensive if you buy uh, quality meat. And it's hard on the pockets, right? But it's actually better for your health. So that's what the dilemma is, and I hope our viewers kind of discern that. Well, you know, that's a really good point that you made, that you make about the protein, and people don't know this. Getting, you, you go to the grocery store, right? Quick Mart or whatever you want to call it, and you grab the meat off the shelf, that has a completely different profile than, for instance, I eat chicken and I eat beef, but yeah, it's expensive because it's grass-fed, it's organic. It has, like you mentioned, I'm glad you brought that up, it has a different profile, which completely changes, wouldn't you say, completely changes how it's going to react in your body. That's With your right. omega-3 and omega-6, that's the big one right there, and it mm -hmm. changes that profile. Yep. So um, plant-based, you know, I... I use, uh, I also use plant-based um, protein powders, again, organic and all that. So it's the same thing. You know, I don't want to take or eat garbage plant-based protein either. But some of these plant-based proteins have a pretty good amino acid profile. I've mm -hmm. studied them, I've researched them. Some of them have a really good amino acid profile and a lot of them you can see right on the um, on the container what the amino acid profile is and by mixing and matching a lot of these things they can get it close to animal based protein but it's plant based so you take your little leucine spike it with that mm -hmm. that little hack will help it so what do you think about plant based protein doc Right. Well, the whole plant-based idea is actually linked to many positive health benefits, Steve. It's associated with the re reduction of all cause, um, anything that would cause illness to the system, especially cardiovascular disease, mortality, and when you compare it to, of course, animal protein. 
Also, modestly, there's a 3% increase in energy from plant-based protein uh, per day in a reduction of risk from illness by 5% versus, of course, animal protein. This suggests that diets based on plant proteins uh, versus animal-based protein may even promote longevity. And going green is not a bad idea if you think about this concept. Uh, let me address the issue also about our obsession for protein intake, which leads to the overconsumption of sometimes animal protein for muscle building. Even on a plant-based diet or the plant-based protein, this still meets the RDA or required dietary allowance. And uh, even if we eat plant-based uh, proteins, and we should not be worried about muscle shrinkage and muscle building uh, if we're taking plant-based sources. One proven problem in the American diet that everybody has to be aware of, it's not the lack of protein, it's the lack of fiber. And it leads to cons uh, constipation and a lot of gut issues. And that's a whole new topic that we should discuss in another session. But if possible, consume more of whole food containing meals featuring various high protein plant-based foods such as beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And consumer demand for plant-based meat alternatives, I have to emphasize this, has increased recently. However, I, want, I warn the public, many of these alternatives are processed very highly and may be containing high sodium and high saturated fats. Keep in mind that many of these alternative meats uh, are not nutritionally equivalent to actual meat as they may lack in certain nutrients such as vitamin B12, iron, and zinc. Well, you know, uh, being in the business myself of, you know, fitness, uh, you, you hear a lot of debate on whether being vegan is stupid. Can you really get enough protein? Um, and you can, but do some vegans get enough? Some don't. I mean, mm. you, even if you're not vegan, you got to pay attention because you ain't not, it's hard to know where your protein is. So you got to pay attention to it either way. But um, being vegan, is it easy to get adequate amounts of protein? Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about, is it, is it dangerous to be vegan? Can, mm -hmm. can you get enough protein being vegan? Um, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but go <laughs> ahead and explain it. All right, well, Steve, uh, yeah, that is a big, um, I guess, uh, uh, dilemma for, for our audience. But it is possible to obtain enough protein from plant-based foods. However, we need to pay close attention to our diet to ensure con uh, consumption of adequate uh, protein is ensured. Most people tend to consume more than the required daily allowance or RDA of protein per day, regardless of whatever they adhere to. May it be a vegetarian, meaning uh, veggies mixed with um, um, dairy uh, or even eggs, or, or fish, or even being an um, omnivorous diet. Depending on the dietary habits and the physical activity of the person, we may need to consume slightly more proteins beyond the RDA to make up for the lower digestibility and absorption of plant-based protein. So this is where plant-based proteins kind of slow down versus uh, animal uh, protein. And the differences in digestibility and uh, plant between the plant and animal protein are very small, but we have to consider this fact though. Certain food preparations uh, or techniques such as boiling, soaking, sprouting, and fermenting can improve the, the, the digestion of plant-based uh, proteins. So don't be biting through that raw kidney bean unless you really want to lose your teeth. But the point there is uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages, and this is where plant-based protein kind of lags in. And many vegans eat soy-based products. And majority of the soybeans grown in, the North, in North America, unfortunately, are genetically modified and grown with the use of potentially harmful pesticides and herbicides. So it's best to choose certified organic soy-based products, such as tofu, tempeh, and even soy milk. So, you know, it, it's just such a fascinating topic. And, you know, I'm, I eat a broad, range of proteins all different kinds but i've done vegan i did vegan for a couple months and it worked pretty well for me i mean hmm. i don't want to say i was surprised but 
Um, my deal is where should my carbohydrates be? But I've done vegan. I did vegan for two months and it, it worked out pretty well for me. So if someone wants to be a vegan, which a lot of people are, and some people really recommend it, and some people feel great on it, mm -hmm. um, what should they do if they want to ensure? Do you have any tips if, for people that they want to ensure that they're getting, you know, the right amount of protein and the right kind of protein and and enough of those essential amino acids because that's a key. You hit on it earlier. Amino acids do everything in your body, basically. Enzymes, yeah. well, enzymes do everything, right? Right. right? And if you don't have the right essential amino acids for your body to make the enzymes in the different protein chains that it wants, you're at a disadvantage. So do you have any tips to make sure, to ensure that someone who wants to be a vegan, you know, long-term can really get adequate protein and be as healthy? I know you can do this, mm -hmm. but be as healthy as someone who eats um, other types of protein. Yep. Yeah, well, Steve, yeah, in our practice, um, as I always uh, see vegans, I always tell them that vegans are not the healthiest. I have vegans who have has cardiovascular conditions. The thing here is when you do vegan, you have to make sure there is a medical professional guiding you through this. For the reason that we actually order blood tests to see nutritional deficiencies in these specific types of diets. That's why being guided your, by your doctor through being a vegan or vegetarian is, is a necessity. And again, here in our practice, we assist um, uh, our athletes, for example, healthy, uh, healthy uh, patients or even sick ones, such as cancer patients or losing muscle. Uh, we provide IV amino acid infusions, oral supplementations through pills, cap, uh, capsules, and shakes. But again, it's all about, yeah, doing a blood test and assessing the patient. But uh, again, let me, not only uh, isolating the vegans, but in general, I want to make a recommendation for protein intake for vegans, and vegans and um, carn uh, carnivores. Uh, in general, protein needs uh, are varying in, in, in every body. In your activity level, body size, and life stage, they're very dependent on. And RDA for protein is actually 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight uh, for the average person. Um, and this is an, a minimally active adult. Well, adults who are who has increased activity levels may require up to 1.2 to 2 gram, 2 grams per kilogram per day. So if you're the ones who really want to uh, compute that, that's our guide right there. When when you're choosing your meat, uh, poultry or fish, opt for high quality options when possible. Whenever possible, here are tips for choosing high quality animal protein. So write this down. Avoiding processed and deep fried meats, like the deli meats, bacons, pepperoni, hot dogs, chicken nuggets, uh-uh, cross that out. Choosing certified organic meat. So look at the front labels. You would see all of that, that green sign right there. Look for grass-fed or pasture-raised products. Look for unprocessed, nitride-free and low-sodium products. Purchase locally raised meat and poultry from farmers or farms uh, that actually are known to produce this. And you can refer to the Environmental Working Group's Consumer Guide to Seafood for safe and sustainable seafood options. So there's a website for that because we're worried about, of course, the, the heavy metals that are contained in these uh, uh, seafood sources that we get. Overall, um, vegan, non-vegan, we all can live healthy lives. And we just must optimize our diet by combining high quality meat, poultry, and seafood with an abundance of fiber-rich foods that we always forget uh, such as non-starchy vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, dark leafy greens, fruits and whole grains. And the lesson here is combining animal and plant-based uh, diets and proteins uh, are, are always essential and everybody is in, individualized in terms of their, their intake of protein. But I would always suggest there should be a predominance of more of the plant-based plant sources. You know, and I, I did, I, I, like I said, I'm not a vegan, but I did it for two months and I felt pretty good, but I was getting a lot because you said I'm, I'm pretty active. I lift weights, mm -hmm. you know, over, you know, two, two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. That's more protein than people think. And that's not easy to get right. if you're focused on that. So when, I, I have to say, 
when I did vegan, I was getting a lot of mm -hmm. protein. I was probably getting, it was all plant-based, but it was probably 150 grams of protein a day, which would mm -hmm. line me right up with that two grams per uh, kilogram of body kilogram, weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, great topic and uh, works for me. I mean, I don't do it very much, but we thank you, doctor. This is a great topic. Uh, Dr. Nario, Biointegrative Health Center. Also, before I forget, those, that amino acid drip, I do that every other week. That <laughs> yeah, thing, that's awesome. That is, that's a vitamin bag and amino acid drip, and that's an awesome drip. I highly recommend it, even though I'm not the doctor. But anyway, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nario, Biointegrative Health Center in Reno, Nevada. You can check them out online, see what different types of um, services they have and a uh, great place. So thank you, doctor. Thank you, Steve. As we all know, the knowledge is power and thank you for letting me provide you with edge and longevity and health maintenance, which I call the biological edge or the bio edge.